Hey everyone, George Christie here with Wine Industry Network. Welcome to Growing Forward, uh, which is our vineyard and grower virtual conference that we launched last year. Last year's conference was very well received and so we decided to produce it again virtually, but we're gonna do it a little bit differently than we did last year and a little bit different than, than all of our other co virtual conferences. Instead of having three or four sessions all in one morning, we're actually going to do a series of educational sessions that we're going to broadcast throughout the course of the year. So we've got this one in March, uh, the next one we're gonna do in July, and then the last one of the year we're gonna do in November. And what that allows us to do is, is take on the most relevant topics or, or most pressing concerns that our grower audience has experienced at that particular time of year. So, you know, we'll talk about things that are relevant in July and July and things that are about relevant in November and November. And we don't need to worry about trying to cover that, uh, all those topics here in March. Uh, now today's session is sponsored by Turrentine Wine Brokerage. It's really the support of companies like Turrentine that allow us to produce and offer these educational sessions for free. So thank you Turrentine for all your support. Uh, today's session is titled New Learnings and Best Practices on Grape Powdery Mildew and Soil Moisture Monitoring. And it's moderated by Brian Ron. Uh, Brian is the president of Coastal Viticulture Consultants. He's put together a terrific panel and I think you're gonna find today's session incredibly interesting and, and certainly very educational. Now, before I hand it off to Brian, if you've joined us for any of our virtual conferences before, you know that it's always our goal to make sure that these are as interactive as possible and so that you, you know, get the most for taking the time that you spent with us. Um, so to that point, we always pre-record our sessions a week or so in advance. We did that for this session as well. And we do that so that you can be engaging with our speakers literally while you're watching their presentation. So just know that all of our speakers are basically watching the broadcast live, just like you are. They're in the chat room. So if you have a question that comes to you, go ahead and fire it off and they'll take those questions on as they come in. So please take advantage of that. I think that just about covers it. Once again, I want to thank you for taking the time to be with us today. I want to thank Turnitine Wine Brokerage. And I think I'll hand it off to Brian and let him take it from here. Brian, take it away. This session is sponsored by Turntine Brokerage, supporting growers and wineries since 1973 by providing the best data-driven analysis to create profitable supply strategies and opportunities. Thank you, George, for that introduction, and thank you all for being here. I'm Brian Ron, and I am the president of Coastal Viticultural Consultants here in California. I am a certified professional soil scientist, certified professional agronomist, and I'm also a certified crop advisor. I've held those certifications for over 25 years. And we're going to talk about powdery mildew spore traps initially, and then we will talk about uh, making irrigation decisions during drought conditions. Powdery mildew spore traps, uh, I'm getting back to a little bit of the basics here. The disease triangle is where this starts. We know we have the host plant. We planted it. We know they have the environment to grow it. And we've always suspected that the pathogen was always present anytime the grapevines were growing. So the environment part for, uh, for, some of, for what we use is something called the Great Powdery Mildew Risk Index. And people also use that number, they call it uh, Great Powdery Mildew Pressure. That's the Goober Thomas model. It was based uh, purely upon environmental conditions, just temperature. It was groundbreaking work and it, it helped growers an awful lot try to understand when powdery mildew would be a problem in their vineyards. Now the great powdery mildew risk index was, was intended to be used after ASCO spore release and used to monitor potential de disease development. So it, it really wasn't ever designed to be a detection process. Is if you, if you had ASCO spores present, then you use the model to figure out how fast it might grow. So this is this is more about the environment. This is the IPM UC uh, website. That's where I got this slide from. And you'll see their index zero to 30 is low and 40 to 50 is moderate. And this is the important part, pathogen status, present, reproduces every, uh, every 15 days. So they always assume pathogen presence. And that is just not the case. We learned that by, and I think that was the revolution of sport traps. Uh, uh, is despite what I used to think, that once grapevines started growing, 
powdery mildew spore, uh, spores or it would be present at all times. So great powdery mildew presence or pressure, because I'm gonna use those terms and I'll just briefly touch on it. Pressure describes how conducive the environment is to growing great powdery mildew. That's the Goobler Thomas model. Those are the numbers that we use. It assumes a pre present, it assumes presence, and we use the term pressure to describe the environment. Presence is observing great powdery mildew in the vineyard. You observe it. And presence is also just detecting great powdery mildew spores in, in a spore trap. So here would be your visual observation. You're, you would see it. And the economic threshold might be here. And you're going to, this is time. And that's the amount of mildew you have. So you'd have this period of time to be able to react to it. With spore traps, you catch the spores as they come into the vineyard. So it gives you more time to react to powdery mildew arriving in your vineyard. Okay, so this CBC pioneered the commercial use of great powdery mildew spore traps. And, and this is important with, in collaboration with, with Dr. Walt Mahaffey, a plant pathologist at Oregon State University. I think it's 12 years now. And what this collaboration led to was uh, figuring out which lab procedures were the best to use, altering the trap designs, and getting a better understanding of just how to use the data. This is a spore trap. This is probably not our, our latest in a, uh, uh, model, uh, shall we say, but this is that we have a lot of these out. This, there's electronics here, there's a solar panel there, and there's a motor, and I will show you a close-up here. This, wrote, this arm rotates at 3,000 RPM. It is an air sampler. There is, a, there is a lubricant placed on these sample rods. You can kind of see a little debris on there. These sample rods are removed. Every week, we have a procedure where we have one-time use nitrile gloves, alcohol spray, and sanitation to make sure that we don't get any cross-contamination. Now, these rods are, are then taken, uh, sent to a, a lab for a qPCR DNA test. They're analyzed for the uh, DNA for powdery mildew of grape, not the one that gets on the weeds, not the ones that get on other plants, but of grape. So the quantitative PCR test is what we choose to use because it has greater sensitivity when compared to, to the other testing methods. And what uh, we were, uh, as a grower myself, I wanted to limit whether or not we would have a false negative or a false positive and the qPCR test is the best tool that we have. The other, the other part of this PCR test, the Q part, is we can actually determine down to a spore or two, how many spores you have. And I thought it was important early on when we had positive and negative tests, when we're looking at those, is having five spores is a lot different than having 5,000 spores. And, I, and uh, that's why we decided to do the qPCR. So let's look at what a, what a graph looks like or what a, a report that we, that we put out looks, looks like. And we'll, we'll look at some data. So on the x-axis here, this is just weekly. You can see we sampled, uh, there may be some rain we didn't sample there. Sometimes we sample a couple times a week, but the, this is the dates of when the samples were collected. This x-axis here, I mean, the y-axis here is, is logarithmic because we were picking up tens of thousands of spores and we had to try to figure a way to get five and 5,000 on one graph, so it's logarithmic. We go one, 10, 100, 10,000, and up it goes. This scale on this side is, is temperature. This is in, the, is in degrees Fahrenheit. Sorry, all you centigrade folks, but this is in Fahrenheit. And this also uh, uh, has the mildew, the mildew risk index from zero to 100. Our scale here, you see our temperatures flatten out, probably should be above 100, where the temperatures get above that. But uh, uh, that, that's the way it's set up now. This, this is the, the legend, the high temperature. This is the high temperature for the day. That's used, that's used in the risk model index. This is the actual risk model here. Powdery mildew index is this purple line. And then this is a, 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 low, a green is good news. No uh, great powdery mildew spore detections. Orange is, is low level, below 10. And then if it's red, it's above 10. And if this is not a 
this is a static slide, but if this were on our, on our database, you would scroll over this and the number would appear what this, the detection is. So just in this example, you can see there were no detections until May 25th. We had a, a low detection. It went into June 15th when the June 15th, and then we had pretty steady detections the rest of the year. Let's look at some stuff, some uh, seasonal variations. This is 2018, it might be a little hard to see, but this, this data is from 2018. Uh, we started collecting that trap uh, on May 7th. Our first detection was around June 8th, maybe June 8th or 9th. And we once we had a detection, we had fairly steady protect, uh, detections for the rest of the year. Now, with this is this is all from the same site. This is in the, somewhere what I would call Mid Valley in Napa. Um, so in 2019, we uh, we have some data drop out here simply because the weather station got fouled up and we couldn't collect it. Our we, again, we didn't get any detections until early June, as we as we sprayed away during this the, during this period of time. We had one low detection, clean again, and then once we got into more or less late June, then we got steady detections and we got some stuff climbing up a little bit as, as we got into July and August. Now in 2020, everybody's powdery mildew program was working really well, primarily because in, in a number of areas, we did not get de detections until July. In this particular instance, we got our first detection on July 20th. So there's a lot of sprays going on and the powdery uh, mildew risk index is high. The powdery mist, uh, risk index is high, but there's no pathogen present. So these are the opportunities that growers can, can use to stretch their intervals and, and uh, Dylan and I are growers too, so we understand the um, uh, stress of not spraying and the importance of mildew in, in wine quality and in your job. So we understand that this is not an easy thing to do. So what I like to talk about is stretching, not eliminating. If you stretch a few sprays, you eventually will eliminate. But in this instance, the risk, it was a great environment to grow mildew. It just wasn't there. And that was in 2020. Okay, here we are, 2021. Um, our first detection was June 21st. And again, again, it was somewhere around July 20th uh, that, that we really got, we got steady detections. And I will say this, people, so, and we'll look at a couple other slides. Anytime I have a detection, and um, presence is presence. So what's a good number? What's a bad number? I'm a grower. Any number is a bad number. If I, if, if I have a crop hanging out there and I've got the pathogen present in my vineyard, I wanna make sure it's protected. So uh, uh, some people will push this, will look at the numbers and push it more than I, than I do, but you know everyone has their comfort level. Okay, this is Sonoma County. This is 2018. Early June is when is typically when, uh, uh, and the reason I, I like people to look year to year, because the idea here is to understand what the spore load is typically like in your vineyard. And uh, I remember when I was starting out, some of the old timers, I guess I'm one of them now, um, would tell me, oh, you spray too much. I dust three or four times a year and I never get mildew. Well, it, that got me thinking, how are they getting away with it? Well, now looking at this data, I understand they just their vineyard just did not have a lot of spore load. Not not all vineyards are like this, and get it looking at it year to year will help you understand when the spore load typically enters your vineyard, and and to plan your your spray uh, program around it. If you do get an earlier detection, then then you have time to adjust to adjust to it. So on this one here, you can see we have some some uh, uh, higher risk index, but nothing present, but pretty much from June all the way through into August, they had pretty steady presence there. That was 2018. This is the same vineyard here in 2019. Just a, 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 a quite a change here. There really was, we picked up something here in, 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 June, uh, in, in June again, about the same time, but then it went clean and we had just low numbers for most of the year. That was in 19. 
20 in this one, we again, it kind of starts about June, but we had much higher inoculum levels. And this is going to, these lower ones aren't as concerning to me as this, as these populations start to get higher. And this is, uh, uh, okay, that was, that was Sonoma County, sorry. This is regional. And I show this because some of these slides make it look like it's all, you know, unicorns and lollipops and there's, there's no powdery mildew spores anywhere. Some vineyards look like this. And if this is what your vineyard looks like, you're going to justify your spray program simply because you have pathogen presence and you've got some high numbers out there. So your, your risk of, of having a, a serious infection is, is uh, quite good. This is same year, 2020. Here's one vineyard. Here's another one. Yikes. With this data, these vineyards are going to be able to spray, stretch, 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 or skip, or however you want to say that, and there's no way I'm going to do that. I'm going to stay. I'm going to. I'm going to stay on my program, and I'm going to make sure I cover. Okay, how do you use it? Directing field operations is is part of it, and prioritizing where you're going to spray first. Um, and, and and this is what I talk to to people who have multiple ranches about. We irrigate where we need to first. We go to the rocky soils, we irrigate there. Then we'll go to the, the, the moderate depth soils and we'll irrigate there. But we tend to uh, spray on, a, we spray north to south or east to west and some sort of rotation. Well, this is gonna help us direct our, our spraying operations or our leafing and shoot thinning what I, uh, uh, based on where the pathogen presence is. So if you need to uh, get some leafing done because you've got a, a dirty spore trap in one particular ranch, well, that's where you're leafing first. And that's where you're going to send your resources there. The other aspect is, is minimizing negative impacts on soil health. And, and I'll let our, 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 grow, our grow, other growers here talk about that. So this is the spray considerations. This is, this is, this is what I, I've taken away from uh, looking at spore traps and looking at, at powdery mildew infections is coverage, coverage, and coverage. You know, yes, timing is important. Yes, rotating materials are important. But most of the problems I see are all coverage. And if you think about it, if you're looking at that canopy and you're gonna and you're gonna spray it, and you're incising. You have grape tissue and those sizing berries as they size that I don't care how much you sprayed in April or May. If they're sizing in June, that brand new tissue on those, on those berries, those grape berries have not been sprayed once. And that's where if you, can, if you look at that canopy and say, well, if I'm going to, I don't know how well I'm going to hit the back of those, those bunches with my spray and you've got the pathogen present, you will have powdery milk. Um, I think, it, and this is kind of my person, Dylan and I's personal uh, choices here. I'll, I, I like to spray early season with, with an eradicant. Or, uh, um, so we kind of clean up our mess from last year. You know, we stopped spraying at Verasion and we grow powdery mildew and we've got the spores in the, in the scales and we've got in the bark. So I like to spray with, with uh, uh, oil an oil mixture early on, and I always spray at bloom, whether I have a detection or not, because um, there's other things to do at bloom, botrytis, there's nutrition, there's a number of things that we need to do. Um, check your nozzles, this, and this is a poor, a poor spray job is not helping very much, and I'm not saying everybody does a poor job, but I think part of our mildew control has been, we just, spray a whole bunch of times, hoping that if we spray it enough, we're gonna get the coverage that we need. Not everyone, but I think that's why we tend to spray a little bit more. The final thing is to not spray fungicides prone to resistance or get into your rotations, but you've probably heard enough about that. All right, I'm gonna look at some data here, just kind of the way I read it. I'm looking at presence here, and I'm looking at an environment to grow a great environment to grow great powdery mildew. I'm spraying that. 
I'm looking at that saying I've, I've got the pathogen, I'm incising, and it's environment to grow it. I'm concerned. As here later on, as the great as the great as the risk index drops because it just gets hot, maybe I'm a little more patient and I and I stretch this and I wait to this next week to see what I've got. And if I stay clean, I think I'm probably going to stretch that. Here's another example. All right. Look at these numbers. I've got high presence, just, and I've got the high risk index. Yikes. Slowing down. I better be leafed, uh, dusting, whatever it takes to cover. Nothing covers like dust. Um, and then as this mildew index drops off, when I'm seeing these levels and I'm seeing the stair stepping, you or somewhere near you has an infection. So I'm not, I, as the risk index drops, and I see this type of this type of pattern. I'm not letting up a bit. Okay. You can we can test the sample spore rods for fungicide resistance, and um, and as we've been told, rotate the modes of action. Sulfur and the oils are not are considered low risk for re, for resistance development, and we are there is more and more resistance developing for the other frac classes. So um, I think anytime we can put these um, oil and sulfur into our mixes, it, it's going to help us because it's going to, it's going to prolong the life of these, of these great chemicals that we want to use. Other uses for spore traps. We are using them now in the winter for Eutypa and bot canker. That's something we started in 21. We're continuing that in 22. Um, and there's some interest, interesting data there, but that's not our subject for to today's topic. The other thing we use the spore traps for is, is to detect Botrytis as well as, as great powdery mildew. I think that's it. Yes, uh, that is all I have uh, for now, and I will turn it over to Dylan. Thanks, Brian. Hi, everyone. My name is Dylan Ron. I'm the Vineyard Manager and Viticulturalist for CVC. I'm here to talk to you about our new CVC Ag app. As we deploy and operate spore traps for growers throughout California, we needed to find a way to present relevant information quickly. Through our app, we can display spore trap information and countywide spore trap network detections. The app updates daily with countywide powdery mildew pressure and presence to help growers make informed management decisions. Through the power of a grower funded network, we've created a tool that is designed by growers for growers. With each grower in the network, we gain an understanding of the current powdery mildew challenges and direct our farming operations accordingly. Now let's look at some data and maps. Uh, up on your screen now is a, an example of our app. Uh, it works on uh, uh, Apple and Android operating systems. And the whole point of this is, is that if you have spore traps on your vineyard, you're able to see each individual location and they're color coordinated to give you that quick glance of where am I currently at with my powdery mildew pressure. Green dictating that there's no pressure or no pathogen present. Yellow meaning that there is low pathogen presence and red, red meaning high pathogen presence. And we came up with the idea of this where it's not just your individual vineyards that are going to dictate whether or not you're going to spray or not. Your growers are also interested of what's going on around me. For instance, the vineyard that we own, uh, we're curious if, if my trap is clean, I'm curious if the other areas are also clean. And with the next slide, we're able to get basically a big overview of California, this is only one area or a couple areas, that being uh, Sonoma, Lodi, and Napa and Mendocino, uh, uh, as we have spore traps all across California. And inside this app, we're able to do a quick overview of the counties that you have spore traps in. For the sake of example, we'll say that we have a vineyard somewhere down here in the South Sonoma, South Napa area. And based off of this May 22nd, that's usually a high time for spraying, or at least we're saying, oh my goodness, we've got to prevent uh, powdery mildew from uh, taking hold and causing a problem later. Uh, so let's spray, spray. Let's make sure that we're on top of everything. Um, uh, and as we go about doing that, we quickly look through our app and we're able to see the areas in or where our vineyard is in location to these areas. We're able to see that it's green, meaning there's no detected pathogen. 
that's a huge deal for us growers. It's telling us that not only am, are my traps clean, it's also telling me that my neighbor's traps are clean. And through the growers network, we're able to create this checks and balances of should I spray? Is it time to spray? Is, are my, uh, uh, my traps are clean, but is the area ready to go? And is the environment telling me that, okay, it's not even gonna take hold at this time. So as we progress through the season, we go to June, we see, start to see certain areas are starting to light up over here in Lodi, South Sonoma. And that gives us as growers an idea of, okay, well, if my vineyard's closer to this side, maybe I need to stay on my interval, or perhaps I'm over here. And again, my neighbors are still clean. One that was possibly uh, uh, has a low detection. So maybe I'll continue to stretch my intervals uh, instead of going every 10 to 14 days, maybe leaning towards 21. And as we continue through the season, we can see quickly again, using the app, we can see these areas start to light up with detections saying that, okay, stay on your intervals, stay on top of your spray coverage. The pathogen is present. And we're also checking on our weather, making sure that not only isn't it present, is it also the environment for it to grow? So we need to make sure that we're staying on top of those things. And eventually, as the season goes on, then it's just go time. We need to stay on top of our spray intervals. The pathogen is here. The environment is ready to go. Uh, uh, we as growers need to make sure that we are getting the coverage that we have. We're rotating our modes of action. We, we Our sprayers are slowing down or doing whatever we need to do to get said coverage. And as we do that, it's so important that we're looking over our shoulder and making sure that all around us, we're not the only ones that have a positive trap, but at least we have an idea as to the pressure for that current season. Um, so as helpful as looking at graphs and data and maps as maps uh, is to us, uh, it's really important to understand how is this actually gonna help growers. And we're fortunate enough today to have a couple of growers who are going to be talking about their use of spore trap data and how it has helped their farming practices. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Matt Frank. Matt is the Senior Director of Vineyard Ops at Trincaro Estates. Matt has worked for TFE for 10 years and has worked closely with CVC on his journey. Matt earned his undergrad at UC Davis and his master's at Washington State University. Matt is a licensed PCA and CCA respectfully. In addition to Matt, we have the wonderful Allison Bettis. Allison has been the viticulturalist at Silver Oak and Toomey Cellars for three years. She covers all of the Silver Oak Estate vineyards in Napa, Sonoma, and Mendocino counties, respectfully. Allison earned her Bachelor's of Science from University of Davis in Viticulture and Enology and is a licensed PCA. Hey, thanks, Dylan. I'm, I believe I'm going to go first. And uh, yeah, my name's Matt. Hi, everybody. I'm going to talk about my experience with uh, spore traps. Uh, I've been with TFE for 10 years, been working with CBC for uh, 10 years too. And Brian approached me uh, four years ago now about these as spore traps. And so, you know, with his encouragement, we had tried, we had decided to give him a try and put, a, I believe it was two out um, and observe the data. We didn't do, uh, you know, we didn't take any action on the data the first year because honestly just didn't trust it. Uh, but what we saw out in the field, um, lined up with what the spore traps were telling us was that uh, at least, you know, the presence wasn't there that year. So the next year, the, the PCAs wanted to get more. Um, I said that was fine, as, you know, with a caveat that if, you know, are you going to use the data? Because it's really hard to, you know, pull a spray. And so they agreed. And so that first year, there was a couple of times where the data was showing that there's no presence. We talked about not doing sprays. And then we'd get a hit. So um, there was one ranch though that we didn't. We uh, we pulled a spray and uh, it was successful. So um, so that was the second year. After that second year, and you know, seeing that it was successful, we uh, you know added to a few more ranches. And then that uh, that third year, uh, we pulled a spray on uh, all of the ranches. And uh, you know, the sport shops were telling us the presence wasn't there. That's what we were seeing out in the field. So we were able to pull the spray and. You know, because of that, um, you know, we saw an ROI, you know, the, the second year, third year, fourth year, uh, every year, they more than paid for themselves because uh, we've uh, reduced sprays. And so that's why I'm here today is just to talk about how, um, you know, we saw an ROI, but I also believe that, you know, other people that use this, um, you know, it's good for the industry. It's good for us, uh, you know, as a whole, if, if we're using this, because if we're spraying less, using, uh, you know, less, uh, doing less passes, using less uh, carbon fuel or uh, gas diesel whatever it is then you know it's better off for all of us so just wanted to share my experience with those and uh you know 
it, every year I don't see uh, see us pulling sprays. You know, if it's a really wet spring and there's high presence, we won't be pulling sprays. But the PCAs, either way, they really like the data because it kind of, you know, it makes them feel better at night if they are pulling the spray or if they're not, it kind of justifies that spray too. Because in the past, using the, uh, you know, the models, the uh, index models, you know, they're kind of, they're kind of, uh, you know, iffy at times. So, you know, that's my experience with the, uh, the spore traps. Well, it's funny to hear you mention that, Matt, um, kind of tying off of that, like I am the PCA who is <laughs> terrified of officially eliminating the spray. And um, our approach this year, this was really our first year working with the spore traps for a whole season. You know, we've heard of them in the past. We, this was kind of the first year we jumped in and implemented them in both Napa and Sonoma County. Um, we really liked what we saw, but we were hesitant kind of since it was our first year of really jumping in and eliminating those sprays. So what we ended up doing was uh, extending our intervals, which led to skipping sprays. We felt a little bit more comfortable, you know, not automatically saying, yeah, we're gonna get rid of spray number five as well. Um, you know, it was something we found as the season went on, we were actually eliminating our more expensive sprays. I don't know if you had that same experience as well, Matt, but those were kind of the sprays that actually, in my opinion, were more crucial to eliminate kind of how Brian was touching on of, you know, let's use some sulfur, some oils, those ones that aren't prone to the resistance, we're saving those chemistries so that they are more potent when we do have an outbreak um, or something we do need to treat. So we had kind of a tie into with some botrytis spore traps as well across some strategic spots. And that definitely helped us sleep a little bit better at night um, knowing, okay, you know, we put on our botrytisides at bloom we're, we, we're okay extending this a little bit more. Um, it definitely made us feel a lot more comfortable. And, you know, ultimately we liked eliminating a tractor pass if we could, um, you know, as Brian said, the soil health is something we've been focusing a lot on. You know, one less tractor pass means less compaction, less hours on that tractor, less diesel burned, um, just kind of that more holistic approach to farming. I don't know, Brian, if you wanna jump in here with a couple of questions. Well, yeah, I, I, I might. I, I, uh, I want to look at the uh, talk a little bit about the soil health thing there, you know, um, in, in particular, I guess what as a grower, uh, what what was our reaction to uh, it rain? It's now rain and all and all of our all of our protection is washed off and our our poor our poor little grapevines are out there with no protection whatsoever. Let's fire up the spray rigs and get out there as soon as possible to spray it, to cover them up. Well, is the pathogen present? Can we wait a few days? Because that is probably the biggest cause of soil compaction is running equipment on wet ground. And that's where that early season, April and May, where we don't have a lot of presence, we can pick and choose a little bit about when, if you are stretching, well, it's going to rain, but there's no presence go ahead and wait till it dries up a little bit. And I know uh, 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 both of you have been working on soil health and compost and those types of things, looking at that more holistic way to, 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 deal, with, to deal with our soils. Um, uh, Matt, do you, are you involved with any of the certification programs at all? Is, is TFE, I mean, the ranches that, that, that you're in charge of? Yeah, all of our ranches are, uh, will, will be at the end of this year, will be uh, certified in the sustainability program. Uh, and uh, yeah, if we can remove sprays, then uh, it helps us, you know, it makes certification easier for sure. It just, uh, you know, most most situations it reduces the uh, the points, right? So, or increases the points, whatever you're going for. So yeah, it's definitely uh, helpful there too with uh, the sustainability programs. How about the soil health issue over there at Silver Oak? I know I, you, you folks seem to be digging into that as well. <laughs> Literally digging. Um, yeah. Great pun there. We, you know, our approach to this wasn't necessarily to meet any, uh, to check any boxes really on any certifications. It was more of how can we treat this land better? Um, yeah, I feel like you hear people say that a lot, but for us, it really was, you know, we've dug some soil pits with you, Brian, but we've seen this compaction kind of firsthand in some of our vineyards and really it's got us thinking like, okay, we keep driving these tractors over, especially when it's wet and everything early on in the season. Can we, can we do something to change that? So we're, 
lessening that impact. So we're not potentially getting, um, you know, our roots slowing down, being unable to get deeper to the water that we need, especially when we don't have a ton of water in years, like the last couple. Um, it, it's really just, like I said, tying into that whole big picture of everything. Um, we did, you know, early on, we will stretch. We, as you said, you apply a you spray kind of when bud break first happens, we get a couple inches of shoot growth. And again, at bloom, we need to get on those nutrients. Um, we eliminated probably at least one spray from across all of our ranches, if not two in some locations, which was pretty amazing to see um, both, you know, it was kind of throughout the season. So it's, I like the idea of, you know, not ex even exposing our crew to as much material throughout the season as well. So it's really from the soil up through to the crew being in there, um, you know, we don't want to be out there, you know, in the grapevine getting it on us. So why would a crew member want that? So it's kind of, it just feels like the right thing to be doing. I'm glad that it is impacting. I know next year we're going to be a little bit more aggressive might not be the right term, but, um, you know, kind of more proactive of like, okay, let's stretch this an extra, you know, five days if we're feeling comfortable and um, kind of having seen that pattern, as you said, like really knowing that spore load of the vineyard. Um, we've also worked a little bit with the um, the trunk disease traps as well. And we're not going to go in too much detail on that today, I believe, but that's really kind of opened up our eyes to the movement of these spores and our whole approach to pruning. Uh, so it's it's fun for even just a learning process too. Yeah, the, those those are tough pathogens, and, and this and, and we uh, uh, we talked about this this morning when we when we were kind of doing our little warm up here is is and I've asked this to of a lot of growers. Do you like to spray? Would you would do it? And I've never got a yes, not one. And as it would, if you didn't have to spray, would you spray? Well, heck no. No, we 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 don't we don't want to spray. It costs money. It's you know it, it was the bottom line. It costs us money. It it puts it burns fuels. It does things we don't really want to do, but we do it because because it, it's so important to keep your crop protected. And 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 that's that's ingrained in us. That's that's hard to hard for us to let go of. So you were talking, Brian, of making sure to plan rotation of sprays and crews and all this. It's from my end, it's very helpful for planning, even just where we're scouting. If we start to see something pop up, if we have hotspot areas, you know, I can go to our tech and say, hey, I need you to pay extra close attention to kind of this area of the ranch. You know, we had something pop up. We don't have um, the powdery, the index to kind of say we have the high pressure. We do have a presence. Can you just keep an eye out for this um, to kind of even play and stretch those intervals a little bit more. So it's just helping with that planning and that strategy of it all. Right, get moving, getting the materials and the equipment moved around, the logistics of it all. You know, I, I imagine Matt, logistics for you guys must be quite a chore covering as many acres as you do. Yeah, and that's, that's a, I guess, a good point to touch on is that the traps, you know, uh, we have a lot more success, at least in uh, terms of like reducing sprays and the kind of the standalone ranches, the ranches that aren't sharing equipment with other ranches, because you stretch an interval of one ranch that's sharing equipment with another ranch, like it, it just affects, you know, that whole chain wherever they're being shared. So we've been focusing more on ranches that have like standalone equipment. So because again, it goes back to, you know, the PCAs and what they're kind of comfortable with too. And they're comfortable with pulling the spray, but they like having that in their back pocket that if, hey, they need to go out there and spray at the drop of the hat, they can do that. So it's been a lot easier incorporating the data from the traps in those kind of standalone ranches, if that makes sense. Um, and uh, yeah, I, you know, it's just, yeah, it's the kind of the, you know, the nuts and bolts and it's the operation because it sounds a lot easier sometimes than it really is. So, and that's, you know, kind of what we're finding out and what we're trying to figure out too. Exactly. And like, like I talk with any, anybody that's working with, with sport traps, baby steps, start by stretching, start by stretching. And then as you start to understand when this portal arrives and you get comfortable with it, it took me a while to get comfortable with it. Then you can start to, and I don't like to say eliminate, we stretch. If there's, if, if there's no pathogen, you just stretch as far as you can. I will say this, we don't have much of a spore load here. We just don't don't know why. So we spray here. We spray it bloom, and then when the trap lights up, we we get into our program. I know I I would not have had the uh, the intestinal fortitude 
to do that if I didn't have that data. And early on, did I scout the bejesus out of it? Oh, yes, I did. I was, I was looking, boy, I was looking and, you know, you can smell mildew. So I was looking and smelling and then digging through those canopies, looking to see if I can find any mildew and, and um, baby steps. And uh, it, it, it's about, it's a valuable tool. And as people get more comfortable with it, uh, then I think it, it, it becomes, it becomes even more valuable. One more thing to add too, it's been really interesting when we're getting the hits, you know, we kind of figured it'd be early in the season and then later on in the season, they kind, of, kind of drop off and it's kind of been the inverse. So, you know, initially we're just like, okay, we we're kind of ready to pull the spray later in the season, but not early in the season so much, you know, our stretch intervals, but then, you know, based on the data, we were just going off the data and the data was not what we were expecting. So it kind of took a year or two, two to kind of be like, okay, you know, reevaluate and be like, okay, well, this is what it's showing. And lines up with what we're seeing out in the field, but it's not what we were expecting. So it's kind of interesting. But it's not what I was expecting either. So, but, and as we start moving into trunk diseases, uh, there's a few surprises there so far. We'll, we'll see how that goes as we, as we continue to study that as well. All right, that was a great discussion. Thank you very much for everybody for contributing to that about the powdery mildew spore traps. I hope you found that interesting. Our next topic is about vineyard irrigation and we're, we're focusing on, on drought again, unfortunately, here in California. And I'm gonna focus primarily on, on, on two subjects. Uh, do I need to pre-irrigate? And if I have limited water, how do I stretch it? I'm not going to get so much into what am I doing week to week. I want I want to just focus on those particular topics. And the one we'll start with here is how to squeak by with less water. And, and we'll, we'll take a look at that now. And then we'll move into the pre-irrigation. All right. That's the, that's the tagline there. Spend water like money because it does cost money. And, and uh, it, it's, it's a valuable resource here in California and all over the world. And evaluating the efficiency of your pumps and your irrigation systems is key, your distribution uniformities. And as a soil scientist, irrigating by soil type, available water holding capacity, not by vineyard block, is near and dear to my heart. You can get a lot more out of your, out of your irrigation water if you're not over-irrigating the gravel and over-irrigating another spot and adjust your systems to break out those uh, irrigation, the soils that have a very different available water holding capacities. Know your soils and affecting rooting depth. Affecting rooting depth basically will, you wanna look at that because you don't wanna push water past your root zone. Use drought tolerant rootstocks where possible. I mean, uh, uh, I find uh, one of the biggest issues for using too much water is having a poor match for your rootstock and your soil conditions. If you do a good job pre-plant of matching the, the vineyard soils to the rootstock, you're gonna have a much easier time of managing it. But sometimes we have vineyards that are planted and they are what they are. And it's, it's much more of a challenge that way. I understand soil water plant relations and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. And also use vapor pressure deficit, v, VPD as part of your irrigation decisions. And, and I'll show you a little data there. Okay, do I pre-irrigate now? My question to you is, what are your water resources? You know, do you have do you have wells? Do you have ponds? How full are they? You know, what's just what 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 do we have in the cover? And then and then the next question is, what is your current soil moisture status compared to previous seasons? And and that that's something that that I want to that we should probably talk about. Um, and we'll look at I'll look at some data and we'll we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay. Why pre-irrigate? Because the soil profile is a great place to store water. And uh, you can put water there, it's stored. We don't get an awful lot of evaporation off of it. And applying water in early spring can limit the, the losses from evaporation. If you're irrigating during, during the summer, trying to push water into these soils, it's very difficult to do that. It's hard to, to catch up. Uh, per se with, a, with a, uh, a drip irrigation system. But in early spring, you do have the ability to push some water into these soils and store some there. Early season water stress can, can result in inadequate, inadequate canopy growth. I, I saw some of that around uh, in a number of places, even with deep soils last year because of the drought conditions. The shoot, the shoot lengths just weren't, weren't like they, they were, they were inadequate. And our first job is grow enough canopy to ripen the crop. 
So pre irrigations can help you put that water to where you grow enough canopy to get the job done. And water stress at bloom, even mild water stress and bloom can cause the berries to shatter. And so our second job is to set the crop. So why pre-irrigate? To grow enough canopy and to set the crop. Okay, measuring soil moisture. I'm gonna look at a couple different instruments uh, uh, measuring soil moisture, talk a little bit about how they work and we'll, we'll just take a brief look at this. Neutron probe, things been around forever, <clears throat> a really accurate tool. It's really the most accurate tool that we have. It's large sensing volume. It's not affected by salinity or air gaps. And what I like is it says stable soil specific calibration in that it is it has big enough volume and it's accurate enough that if I go and do a calibration on some soils and I come back and look at it the next year, I have a very high degree of confidence where how close to fuel capacity you are. It's, pro, it's limitations. It's Certified personnel, it's heavy and cumbersome, and you got to drag it out there, and you only get periodic soil measurements. Kind of the newer kids on the block are these capaci the tube capacitance probes. There's two different versions. Here's one that you would insert into a, an access tube. Here's one that's kind of, it's not a good photo of it, but it's, it's cast in resin, so it's more durable than this, than this particular model. Um, more continuous readings, and some of the soil probes can measure temperature and salinity too. You, get, you really get more detailed information about water movement in your soil. You're, click, you're getting the measurements every 20 minutes. And some of that data can, can give you some real valuable insights. But like everything, they've got their good, they've got their bad. The sensing sphere of, of these instruments is relatively small, one and a, one, about one and a half to two inches off of the tube. And I was surprised to learn that. I'd looked at a number of probes that claimed they had more, more influence than that. I can't find data to support it. So for reliable measurements, and this is if you're gonna use those ty that type of equipment, and I do, I use them both. Um, for reliable measurements, you have to really make sure you've got good soil to uh, uh, sense or contact. And you uh, most of those types of tube type uh, uh, sensors uh, you put a slurry in to take all the air gaps out. So installation and placement of those are critical. A good installation, a good tight installation with just a little bit of slurry, but to make sure you get the seal and to have that, make sure your that probe is close enough to your drip emitter to be in that zone of influence because it doesn't reach out very far. Uh, some of the other issues are limited soil depths, you know, in some models, four or five feet. Uh, the neutron probes, I think the, the deepest we ever read with that was 15 feet in a fig orchard. And yes, we pulled up roots and water use down at that depth. This is just shows you the soil sensing issue here. Neutron probes, it's a 10 to 32 inch sphere. This is the capacitance probes have this little donut. If you're looking at this big photo here, you have this sensing influence here. You don't really have much happening here, but Installed properly and and uh, and handled properly, you can get some good data out of those. And it's been and so uh, uh, they both have their place. They both have their limitations. Uh, I, I use again. I use them both. Okay, let's look at some soil moisture data. This is this is the uh, capacitance probes. And this uh, and um, this slide has to do with with looking at how deep the soil the soil water goes. Here, this is time going here on the x axis, and this is these are uh, eight inch depth, eight, 16, 24, 32, 40, 48. So this is a 48 inch probe. Here's the legend here down below. Um, so you can see the soil moisture was, was cruising along pretty much flat lined and then an irrigation event occurred. And we had a bump in the first and, in the, and the eight inches and we, hit, we had a bump all the way down to 48 inches. So this water could have traveled deeper than 48 inches. If your root zone is was 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 not below 48 inches, you may have wasted some water. You also, uh, uh, with this constant line, you get you see these these drawdowns. You see some some stair stepping and some other things with these probes. But again, this probe is a 48 inch probe, and if your root zone is five or six seven feet deep, you wouldn't be measuring your entire entire root zone. If it were limited to 48 inches, then you would. So everything has its place. This, this is neutron probe data. It is uh, more, you don't see that drawdown from, from uh, week to week, but you do see it. You don't see what happens here. 
but in, in viticulture, this system does work. Here's, here's an example where they you see that it went up here from the, here to here, it did increase, but only the top two feet increased. So basically your water application was limited to the, the top two feet. Over here, we got a bump all the way down the soil profile. We've got a bump down to six, six feet. So if your root zone was deeper than six feet, you'd be pushing water down below, down below your root zone and you wanna, you wanna avoid that. So they both will do similar things. They will show you drawdown. They will show you increases. That just, they, 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 do, they do it a little bit differently. Okay, this is looking at soil data. Now we're talking about, okay, you've measured your soil, your, your soil moisture, and you're gonna take a look at this data and figure out what you wanna do. These, this is out of our database. This, it was, uh, let's see, I have 19, which is this kind of this pink. Then we have 2020, it's red, and then green here is 2021. Here's our data point for, for 2022. And based on this, I'm not too worried about it. If you look at where the soil moisture, this kind of, I don't know, snake of data that rolls around like down through here, we're kind of right in the middle of it. I'm not too worried about that. If the, if my data point here, or or if my if if my this is a totalizing graph, this isn't just one one foot or six feet. This is a total available water in the root zone here, the Cabernet Sauvignon vineyard. Um, this this data point is right kind of in the middle where it always runs. So I'm not too worried about it. Had this data point been down here, where in the past we have triggered irrigations, then I would be concerned and I, and I would probably want to go ahead and pre-irrigate that. Because again, if, if, if the soil moisture is in a status where in the past I've applied water, more than likely if you don't apply water, if it's down here, you will, ha you will have inadequate shoot growth. Okay, know your soils and effective reading depth. This is it, this is, this is one of the keys, this is, it, Varying soils uh, or varying water holding capacity across the irrigation sets is probably our biggest waste of water. Um, this is soil resistivity. I think we're gonna have another webinar about soil mapping and soil resistivity. So I'll leave that till then. I'll just suffice it to say that this instrument allow, identifies where uh, soil textures change in this particular little vineyard block. This was a clay, uh, clay loam clay here. This was really gravelly and the rest was kind of gravelly loam. So you can see as if you had one irrigation system irrigating this entire vineyard, you would be, you know, applying too much water here and not giving this enough. But with, with this type of information and whether you're using soil resistivity or backhoe pits or a shovel or a soil auger, you can do it a number of ways is figure out where, you, where your soils are, what their water holding capacities are, and what your potential root zones are. And with, with that information, then you can lay out an, ir, uh, uh, an irrigation system that will precisely, will better and more efficient, efficiently apply the water. Aerial imagery, good tool as well. Um, uh, soils are better, but this can still give you some hints. When you look at this here, I don't know if this shows up very well on this slide, but you've got two really different uh, patterns in this particular block. Here you've got some stronger areas and some weaker areas that maybe this is a little more difficult to separate out as calico -y, as opposed to something like this, where you have two real drastic uh, regions. But so the aerial imagery can also help you identify zones that just look different, and then you can look at your irrigation system, look at your pumping system and figure out, can I isolate some of these spots and, uh, and be more efficient with my applications? Okay, we're gonna look at uh, plant measurements and canopy temperatures. All right, first we're gonna look at this soil, soil release curves. And the reason I'm gonna do this is this is uh, available water content. We're getting higher as we go this way. And, and then this is more stress here, water tension increases. The, where you see these real rapid losses of, of soil moisture here, see it, draw, it changes and then it flattens out here. This is the large soil pores. And this has to do with soil health, maintaining your, your soil pores in, in, in the surface soils. The soil pores, that's where the easy water comes from. The grapevines can draw that water from the large, large soil, soil pores very rapidly. As its curve flattens here, these are, this is available water, but it's more tightly held. So if you're having more 
uh, overcast conditions, 70 and 80 degrees. The grapevines can sit on top of those soils with, and those in that more tightly held water and draw it out. It's when we get those uh, heat spikes. When they get the heat spikes, they can't draw this water fast enough. And the way I describe this is the large soil pores is like a glass of water. You can drink from it. The tighter, the smaller pores are more like drinking through a straw. You can drink from it. But if you have to chug it, you can't draw it through the straw fast enough. So when we get to these heat spikes to manage our, to manage our fruit quality and our canopy temperatures, you need some water in those large soil pores for them to be able to draw that. Okay, this is Dr. Kennedy's slide here. Great slide, love this one. Uh, this is flowering here. You've got, this is cell division. So flowering, lag phase, abrasion, here's ripening. This is cell division. So if you're trying to grow, if you wanna get bigger grapes, you're gonna, you're gonna irrigate here because you're gonna have more cells. Cell division ends, and now we're just gonna make the cells that we have bigger. So if you're looking to restrict berry size, well, we're not gonna irrigate until we get to lag phase. And, I, and the, uh, we, we want to induce mild or moderate water stress pre-lag phase, but that's getting into how, how do I irrigate? Uh, and I'm, I'm not, I don't think we have time to address that today, but this is what I wanted you to look at. Cell division is here. And then here we are into ripening. And so we're, we're making sugar, we're making anthocyanins, we're making color, and we're making flavor compounds. And in order to do that, the grapevine has to be physiologically active to do it. And as we reach these real high stress levels like that the physiological process will, will stop and we won't get flavor and color occurring. We might get some sugar accumulation and dehydration, but you wanna keep them as active as we possibly can. Okay, we talked a little bit about this, shatter at bloom, excessive water stress, weak growth, you can't ripen our crop. We're gonna have you know, reduced fruit quality, reduced uh, bud fruitfulness for the following year. And also uh, this is uh, smaller spurs and canes at pruning time. So again, that whole thing about pre-irrigating and getting enough uh, canopy to ripen the crop also gives, gets you spurs that are big enough to prune to as opposed to stuff that you're cutting down to one buds because it will perpetuate that the low yields. Okay, this is stuff I just saw the other day, Elizabeth, uh, uh, she goes by Beth, I guess, Forstel, uh, gave a talk about dealing with heat spikes. She would, did, did some work, and some graduate students did, did some work in Lodi there in the uh, uh, Borden area, and it was uh, Cabernet Sauvignon and 1103 Paulson. And what they were looking at, and, and I'm just going to briefly touch on this. This is not my work. I'm just going to just show, uh, she had some slides that I thought were fantastic, and I wanted to share them. They, they, they had three treatments. Baseline, which is basically they were applying 60% of ET. That's, a, that's more water than we would apply out in the coast, but typical for uh, some rolling hills out in that zone. And then in the heat spikes, they would double it just and, and or triple it. So there wasn't like we're going to put on 20% more, man. They were hammering it if they're tripling the water that they're putting on. But it was a great, it was a great experiment, experiment because it, 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 it was just a real rough way to see, well, what happens if? If you look at these curves, and this is something that I want, it was that this is photosynthetic activity. The, the baseline at 60%, applying 60% of ET, which is a, a good shot of water, that when you had the leaf temperatures, the leaf temperatures exceeding 35 degrees C, which is about 95 degrees, you are already starting to get a drop in photosynthetic activity. And why is that important? Again, I do this. We need that to make this happen. So as this starts to drop, then our ability to make colors and flavors drops. And that's kind of what we're here for. Now, as they put on more water, you could see that, that the, the temperature at which it started to drop increased. And this is, I think it's about 104. So somewhere around 100 degrees, no matter how much water you give them, you're getting a, a net reduction in photosynthesis. Okay, this is leaf temperatures. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about how we do this or, 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 or where we do it, but we do do this. It, it, we look at leaf temperatures in real time. There are two, uh, this scale here is 
is the uh, leaf temperature. Uh, there's two lines there. One we call the morning leaf and the afternoon leaf. And basically we are separating out the canopy with the leaves that have light on them and leaves that don't. This scale is in Fahrenheit again, sorry, the uh, centigrade, centigrade folks, but but that uh, but this is about 100 is about 38, and I think 95 is right around uh, 35. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I might be wrong on that. But if you look at this, we try we are trying to hold our canopies below 100 degrees Fahrenheit because again, we want to maintain our photosynthetic activity. Here, there is a series of four days where we had some pretty high spikes. I went ahead, this is a wall scroll over, this slide is static. Um, the canopy temperature hit 114 degrees. So, yikes. Here was the air temperature in that same zone was 103, yet our canopy was 114. Okay, well, why did that happen? Well, the vines well, didn't have enough water to cool themselves. The soil moisture was probably low, although I'm sure they were putting on some irrigation. The other aspect of it was VPD. Was, and that calculation not only looks at temperature, it looks at humidity. And this, and I, and I read this, I wish I had the source for this, I don't. But I, I think this kind of galvanizes it. It's, you know, vapor pressure deficit is important because it represents kind of that, that force of evaporation from the land to the atmosphere. It's kind of how hard the, it, you're looking at the difference between a, um, sat, a saturated condition and the relative humidity that, that's, avail, that's, avail, that's available right now. It, that difference is that deficit. And that is kind of how hard the atmosphere is kind of pulling on the plants. That's, that's, that's another way to look at it. So what happened with that VPD, you can see here, the VPD spiked on August 28th. And that's when, and the temperature did as well, but the spike wasn't near as, wasn't near as great as, as what we saw in some of these temperatures. So if, you're, if you don't have much water and your canopies aren't really exceeding 100 degrees by much, and I would save my save if I had a limited amount of water. I would save it for the high for the low for the uh, uh, high VPD events. And a high VPD events really typically occur when humidity drops below twenty percent. So if there is a high VPD event in the future, and I and you're wondering should I spend my water now? Yeah, I would say I would say I would to try and limit the these really high spikes in in leaf temperatures. Let's look at a little more data here. This is more from, from uh, Dr. Forstel. And this was a heat event. Uh, they call it heat event two. This was during, uh, this was during ri the ripening phase. I believe the high temperature was around 105. And you can see in the baseline, this is flavanols. This is time across here on the, uh, on the uh, X axis. And during that heat event, the extra water prevented that drop. In flavanols in that fruit, they were pretty much tracking the same when they hit that high heat event and and, and were not and did not cool them. Again, that kind of easy easy water that they can drop that they can take up and cool. Then we then we had a clear uh, clear reduction in uh, in flavanols there. Same with anthocyanins. Um, you uh, time here here is heat event two. They're tracking about the same. We did have look like we got some recovery there, but. You still had that drop that separated these that separated these three out. That two X baseline seemed to be have the, the the best color there. And again, this is this is her work. I I, I haven't studied it in detail, but I did uh, 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 take a look at, at at some of their data. Uh, this is this is now this is a this was a, a subsequent year, and this shows something a heat event three, and it drops out. So, anthocyanins drop out again. But what was interesting here, I thought, was that the tannins dropped out, but they did tend to recover somewhat. Uh, the separation here looks like the separation might be the same here, maybe a little bit worse. So I think there's there's more work to do there, but clearly the, the, the data just kind of stares us in the face that when we have these heat spikes, if you're gonna, if you're trying to manage anything, and I'm trying, you know, and I've only got so much water, managing those heat spikes is is is, is going to be important if you have enough water to do so. I think I've got one more busy slide here. Yes, this is 
another look at real-time leaf temperatures. And I don't know that I'm gonna go explain this in detail to everyone here, but this here is, is ambient, this is ambient air temperature. This is the diurnal cycle. Looks like we are about 90, here's the scale here for, for ambient temperature. This is comparing leaf temperatures to ambient. And the reason I show, show you this, this slide is, when this is the pattern where we're tracking seven, seven degrees uh, above, the leaves are seven degrees hotter than ambient. When I showed you that other slide where you saw, well, it was 103, but our canopy temperatures 114, that thing was 11 degrees warmer than, than ambient. And that is a clear sign that they are not getting enough water. But when they, the water was applied, and this is a diurnal cycle in the morning, they tend to follow ambient air temperature, and then the, the one side of the canopy would cool, the other side of the canopy would warm. But uh, the reason I like this particular slide is that we did irrigate, and in the middle of the next day, the temperatures finally did come down. And the difference in temperature between when you put on a good shot of water to manage a heat spike, they're now tracking minus seven. They were positive seven, we cooled that canopy by 14 degrees by you by by putting on enough water to, to uh, during a heat spike and as and this this is this uh, what a graph looks like for a a well irrigated vineyard but it is possible to through looking at real time leaf temperatures or periodic if you if you have the tools to do that to go out there and measure them periodically to try to figure out how much water does it take to what I call flip them to to cool them or to get them down below that 100 degree mark and get them somewhere in the 90s and I think that's uh, all I have here and I'll open this up to the rest of the crowd if if anybody has has any uh, comments uh, they would like to make um, Let's talk about it if, you, if, if you'd like to. Yeah, I'll jump on in here, Brian. Um, I would have to say we kind of come to the same conclusions ourselves. You know, we use several different methods for measuring water stress throughout the season from soil moisture probes, especially early on to, you know, stomatal conductance. We take shoot length measurements. Um, we do use the leaf temperature sensors as well. And the two key things we've taken home in the last few years is it really matters when you have a so full soil profile with water at bud break and then irrigating prior to a heat event. And then if you have the ability to running sprinklers during those high BPD events. Um, so we kind of, you know, in seeing it outplay in the vineyards, we're kind of coming to the same conclusions as well. Um, you know, last year, a lot of people dealt with low crop so this year, you know, going through, we're realizing we're seeing the same pattern as last year. We start to do our undervine cultivation for weed control and we're seeing dry soil in some places or our cover crop already drying out. You know, we're already throwing on water and we're making sure we have a full soil profile. I feel like somewhere I heard that uh, even 5% less water in your water or soil profile at bud break can lead to you know, stunted canopy growth, reduced crop set, uh, this sort of thing after a lower crop yield last year, everyone I'm sure is <laughs> hoping not to repeat that again this year. Um, and then, you know, and later on during the season, we'll, if we know that we're going to have a big heat wave, I think back in uh, 2019, I believe we kind of had that really uh, big one in August, unless that was 2020. Years are blending together now. Um, but it was, we kind of tried to get water on that week before. So the vine could already take it up and kind of had that ability to buffer itself against that. So we didn't get leaf temperatures flying up into 114 degrees. And then at some of our sites where we have some frost sprinklers, we actually ended up running those. As soon as we kind of were watching our weather stations, we saw that humidity start to drop really low and temperatures start to climb. We turned those on and um, we were really happy in some places where we maintained kind of our, uh, our berry integrity. We didn't get a lot of dehydration and the quality was actually fantastic. Um, so yeah, it was, it's a very interesting to see that play out in the field, um, and kind of, you think you understand what are the best decisions and all it takes is a couple years of, you know, 80 degrees in February with little water and you kind of go, Oh, I need to rethink this a little bit. And, you know, we should be irrigating before we have any green tissue. And so it's interesting to have these various tools because it really, 
puts that full picture together. So we're not just going, we think we're making the best decision. We have that data to back it up as well. Great. Yep. I, I agree. You know, just when you start to think you got it, you get it, uh, have it figured out. Mother nature humbles you very quickly <laughs> and you, and you learn a new lesson. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So unfortunately this year was kind of sort of, you know, it's kind of reminiscent of last year too. And, uh, uh, you know, the, though the feedback we've gotten back so far from winemaking is, uh, yeah, quality was pretty high last year if, uh, you know, it wasn't uh, hammered with the smoke, you know, depending on the region. So, um, you know, the winemakers wouldn't be uh, remiss if, uh, you know, quality mirrored last year's. But, uh, yeah, the uh, tonnage, uh, we, we can't mirror last year. And uh, what we saw last year, you know, the, uh, the ranches that did do some pre-irrigation, you know, there was correlation there between, uh, you know, pre-irrigation and tonnage. It definitely, definitely uh, looked like uh, if they did that, you know, tonnage was a little bit higher, especially, especially in the uh, production ranches. So, uh, you know, this year we are uh, doing pre-irrigation right now almost everywhere. You know, I think uh, almost all the production ranches, well, I know all the production ranches are. Napa, most areas are doing pre-irrigation. Sonoma, most. Again, you know, there's some lower uh, spots that, uh, you know, based on your uh, measurements, like they don't need water right now, so we're not watering. Um, Lake County, yeah, watering everywhere. The uh, foothills, we weren't watering, and I've uh, got two inches up there this morning, so probably the right call to hold off up there. Um, but then, yeah, even in Napa, though, uh, you know, where maybe tonnage, we're not pushing tonnage, but we want to have a full canopy because, you know, if we do have some of those heat events, if that fruit is exposed, it's just, uh, you know, it's going to get fried sitting out there. So where we don't have uh, a full profile there, we are trying to fill it up just so that we can get, you know, a decent sized canopy to protect that fruit if we need to. You know, if there are some heat events, which seem to be uh, a lot more consistent uh, year over year. Uh, I, I agree. Um, so... So you're looking at soil moisture, and if the soil moisture looks like it's off, you're trying to you're trying to bring it up. You're doing the best you can to bring it at field capacity. And no matter what we do with our uh, with our drip systems, uh, if we're not using our sprinklers, uh, Allison has some sprinklers, which is great, and has the, the water resources to do that. We're just we're we're filling up that onion, and that the aisleway, the drive row, is still dry as a bone. So, um, you know, we have, we haven't changed that. So it's helping. And, uh, I don't know if other people saw this. I saw some, some soils in Napa Valley floor that I thought I would never see wheat growth in because they're just so big, deep soils, but I, but we absolutely did. And so we need to start looking at our floor management. Um, you know, what we're doing with our cover crops, we, you know, cover crops are a great thing and biomass building biomass and putting that into the soil for soil health is is a good thing tillage um uh oxidizes organic matter if you till you're going to oxidize organic matter so you uh, you have to be aware of that if you're if you're you know i don't have the water resources to 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 have a cover crop i know there's some research out that that they don't use that much water and 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 that's interesting research but i know I personally have seen a, 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 the effects of cover crops, particularly on younger vineyards, where they have devigorized de them, where we've had to go in and till every other row to get the growth until we get them a big enough and established enough to be able to tolerate the, the cover crops. But that's all that's all part of your 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 management decisions. If you are uh, tilling your your cover crops in, then then uh, because you just don't have the water, then I think you really need to look at you know uh, am I bringing in compost? Am I a, a biomass builder? How are you gonna how are you gonna put that organic matter back into your system? Because you are your your uh, overall vineyard long longevity is tied to soil health. It just is, and the healthier our soils are, the be the the longer your vineyards last. So you know, trunk diseases aside, but we're working on that. <laughs> we'll see what we can we'll see what we'll see what that data looks like. But but that that's good to know. So you're using data dri driven decisions. We look dry. We're, we're we're applying water there, and then to try to make sure we get in uh, the, the our job one grow grow enough canopy. Job two set that crop. Great sound. Uh, obviously, you two are very experienced and very good at what you do, so I'm not surprised that's what's going on. But, uh, um, well, that's great. Um, thank you all for, att for attending and for listening. For those of you who, who are still awake out there, 
uh, Allison and Matt, thank you so much for doing this. We really appreciate it. And thank you to Win Networks for, for, for putting on this this presentation. It was a, a pleasure for us to be here. And I, uh, I hope, hope everybody here had some fun. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, thanks, Brian.